Uh, welcome everyone to this Data.Europa Academy webinar on geospatial harvesting on data.europa.eu. My name is Giulia Carsaniga and I'm a research and communication consultant for data.europa.eu, the European portal for open data. Today, I have the pleasure to uh, open this session during which my colleagues Jan and Tora, uh, who will introduce themselves later, will talk about geospatial data and the process of harvesting of this data on data.europa.eu. But uh, before going into the details of our agenda, let me remind you of some <laughs> rules of the game. As you can see, uh, this webinar is recorded. Um, the recording will be made available to you uh, following the session, and we will make sure to um, also inform you via, via email. Um, second of all, uh, if you can please switch off your mic and uh, your camera during the session so that the speakers can smoothly present. Also, at the end of the session, we will ask you to kindly provide your feedback. It takes really two minutes, uh, but it helps us um, enormously. And finally, uh, for this session, uh, we will use Slido. So um, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, do scan the QR code that you see uh, on this slide or go directly to uh, Slido, uh, Slido and insert the code GeoHarvesting2022. I will wait a second that everyone can maybe scan the code. <laughs> And I think uh, we can <laughs> go into, into the topic. So let me um, keep the words now to my uh, colleagues, uh, Jan and uh, Tore, who will um, provide the content of this session. <laughs> Thank you kindly for the introduction. Um, so I'm Toro Fechner um, from a company, uh, it is called Conterra from Münster, Germany. We work for data.eu.eu and um, we are located in Münster, Germany and have a joint team with a partner um, company which is called 50 Degrees North and together we are responsible for the geospatial dimension um, of the portal, meaning we are responsible and we have created the geo harvesters which um, are used to collect the metadata from all the different geo portals in the European Union and the partner states. Um, we have created the gazetteer, the backend basically to find locations in the data.europa.eu portal. Um, we handle the geo visualization and we often handle real time data in the portal, which um, has often a spatial dimension. Um, I will have a certain portion of the talk today, a couple of slides, and then my colleague Jan, um, who has uh, done quite a bit of development work on the portal, will have a couple of slides. Um, and uh, as a quick warm up, again, we want to use Slido um, for you. So please scan the QR code um, if you have not done so already. And the question we have as a quick warm up so that you get the spirits up and the attention high is which country are you in right now? And uh, you can use this QR code, which is here as well. And as you type in your answers in this poll, um, and we see that there is already quite a bit of participants typing, excellent, we see where you're from, or where you are not from, but actually joining from, that's correctly. And uh, this is a quick just warm up for you and us so that we see that Slido is working correctly and that we have a nice picture of the international audience we have here. Excellent. I see Belgium, Italy, France, Denmark, Latvia, Slovakia, Spain, Sweden, and you see this all as well. Quite nice. Ireland with a smiley, excellent. The moon, that is um, quite an interesting location you are joining from. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I think this was a good warm up. Let's quickly uh, check the agenda. Um, so we have a, a roughly an hour and we want to introduce basically and provide you with an understanding of how um, geospatial data and metadata reaches the data.eu portal, how the harvesting process, the geo harvesting process works. And we have split the agenda in a couple of topics. We have now the introduction and the goal of the webinar where we 
discuss all of the um, uh, aforementioned points. So where does the metadata originate from? What kind of journey does it take from perhaps your geo portal to data.europa.eu? Um, and uh, we want to answer all the questions you have there. And um, we look in detail at the geo harvesting process. That is the section Jan will do. And then we'll have a Q&A afterwards because it might be the case that um, we haven't covered everything you might wonder. And so please use the opportunity in this webinar to answer questions afterwards with Slido. And then we'll have a quick summary and feedback uh, and the um, form we mentioned to help us improve. So without further ado, um, this was the introduction and the goal of the webinar. We wanted to talk to you about what kind of geospatial data is available at data.geo.eu. We want to um, look at the portal and uh, the, the journey, basically, the metadata and services which are covered and the process which is there. And this is what I'm now going to, to start, basically, in the second point of the agenda. So as a quick reminder, and probably all of you know what data.europa.eu is about, but in the end, data.europa.eu provides access to open data. It's the, and I mean, I stress the, the single access point to open data in Europe where all of the um, yeah, open data sets are basically collected. It has a strategic objective to improve the accessibility of open data. So meaning it's not only collecting the data, but it's also a strategic objective to improve the accessibility and increase in turn the value of the open data sets which are there. Um, at the moment, we have quite a bit of catalogs covered um, and uh, data sets yeah, harvested. Um, it's 176 catalogs all over the different member states, but not only the member states, also partners such as Norway, Switzerland or Ukraine. Um, there's roughly 1.5 million data sets harvested or uh, exposed via data.europa.eu. Um, and uh, you see that we also have quite a bit of data stories and e-learning courses in the academy here. So this also helps to improve the value and the accessibility of open data in the European Union in general. Um, so if we now switch from this point of view to how is the metadata, the geospatial metadata harvested and how where, where do we look for that basically in in from a portal point of view. We look at the open data catalogs in the different states and the geo catalogs because typically um, we have one or more catalogs in each state. So for example, um, there's quite a bit of, of states which have one national open data portal and various um, other levels of federal or other uh, open data portals which are organized in, in a large network. And we have the same uh, landscape with the geo catalogs. We typically have one national geo portal or geo catalog which collects all the Inspire metadata and all the Inspire data. And we harvest both um, catalogs for data.eu. So we only look at open data from the open data catalogs because that's the, the mandate, but we do not only look at the Inspire data from the geo catalogs. We also collect not Inspire compliant or not uh, conform Inspire metadata from the national geo portals because there's also value in there and we want to expose this data as well. Typically, we have in the geo catalogs a certain amount of Inspire conformant metadata, but also other data sets which are not mandated by the three annexes of the Inspire directive. And those mm -hmm. are also collected. Um, also, certain international institutions like Eurostat um, or the International Council for the uh, Exploration of the Sea or HELCOM, the Baltic Marine Environment Protection Commission, um, are also harvested. So there's a couple of supranational or international institutions which are also harvested and exposed in data.eu. Um, what kind of geospatial data can be found on data.eu? So if we focus on the geo side of things, we have typically two services. So 
API-based access points. We have the OGC web mapping service and the OGC uh, feature services, the so WMS and WFS. And we have quite a bit of um, yeah, data sets or files, GeoJSON, shapefiles, GPX files, GeoTIFFs, and all the other different formats we all know and sometimes love in our daily work. Um, there's quite a bit of geodata on the portal. If we sum up the total amount of WMS and WFF services, which is not fair because often data sets are exposed as WMS and WFS at the same time, we get quite the uh, large number if you compare it directly to CSV files. So roughly 250,000 CSV files. And if you add up WMS and WFS, then you get a similar amount, but again, uh, often they're exposed via both services, especially if it's vector data. And we have lots and lots of uh, data with indirect spatial information. Um, when a data set has, for example, coordinates in it or like an address or a postal code or a municipality identifier, which is then also considered geospatial data. Metadata schemes. Um, Probably quite a bit of you are familiar with the Inspire mandated metadata schemes, which are uh, yeah, published and specified in the ISO specifications. Uh, the most relevant here is ISO 19139, um, which is uh, describing how Inspire metadata um, should be delivered um, with a uh, catalog service for the web, which is an open geospatial consortium standard, which is like the geo side of things. And then we have the open data side of things where we have um, the DCAT AP um, profile from the European Commission, which uh, is comprises of a yeah, DCAT vocabulary from a W3C um, recommendation. And then uh, as an add-on to cover all the specific geo side of, yeah, fields geodecad ap which was uh, researched quite a while back from different institutions and which is in essence an extension of decad ap for describing geospatial data sets data series and services uh, in essence geodecad ap um, in its extended version so it has two versions covers all of the um, inspire iso 19139 metadata fields which are needed so they are fully compliant to each other and well aligned and this is what we use in the harvesting process because when we harvest geo metadata we need to make sure that it's translated um, properly to the DCAT application profile metadata standards and this is what we will now discuss in the geo harvesting process i've got only two further slides in this and then i will hand over to my colleague jan who will go in depth um, and the first one i have in this agenda point is this is a harvesting chain basically so there's an, an harvester which is capable um, of harvesting geospatial metadata and non-geospatial metadata and it has different subcomponents like the geo harvesting which is capable of translating and talking to existing geo catalogs which are exposing their well standardized uh, metadata through the CSVW endpoint and the ISO 19139 metadata. And the geo harvester requests the metadata in that format in the harvesting process of data.geopod.eu and translates it um, via the um, established translation rules or alignment rules between uh, DCAT AP and the ISO metadata um, to a format which is understood by the general harvesting mechanism of um, the data.geopod.eu portal, and then um, it's stored in the portal and can be found and exposed and used. And the same is true for the open data catalog uh, out there, but we don't need like this translation mechanism uh, through that pipeline. Um, and if we go one step further, because this is only the high level view of the data.geobot.eu portal, um, there's all the different open data catalogs uh, on a national level and all the different geo catalogs um, on the national level. And as we want to show you here with the different um, lines, sometimes the geo catalogs are exposed to the open data catalogs on a national level and to the geo catalogs on a national level. So uh, consistent identifiers are a big uh, must so that we don't have too many duplicates in um, the harvested metadata. So on the national level, the same structure usually applies as well. And we'll have a deeper look at that. 
Um, this is the point where I will hand over to Jan, my colleague, who will explain how the geo housing works in more detail. Um, he will show you um, how like a metadata set travels from a geo catalog to data.georobot.eu and on specific slides um, where we give you some some so cases, Giuseppe will post the URLs of those specific portals so that you can have a look um, for yourself. So thank you and Jan, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thanks Tor. Um, yeah, basically the idea now is that we We've heard the theoretical idea how um, the metadata is harvested. And um, what I would like to do now is have a look at one metadata set that is available in data.europa.eu and then um, try to follow it from its origin, see what steps uh, it goes through and um, where it is translated and what happens there. And so um, we picked a data set from the Federal Agency um, for Nature uh, Conservation. And um, well, it describes the reproductive areas of porpoises, which are uh, little whales in the German North Sea. And um, so here you can see the end product. So what is at the end of the chain? when the metadata has been harvested and now we go to the beginning so um, this is a screenshot from the the catalog of that um, agency so um, it's a catalog that normally or is intended to um, manage inspire metadata but as Toro already said not all metadata that is managed here is actually or necessarily also um, in uh, part of the inspire or is required by inspire um, so it's not necessarily everything in the annexes of inspire um, but still the fact that it is a catalog to um, um, manage inspire data basically leads to the fact that all the data is um, available in ISO 19139. Um, so this catalog offers a CSW endpoint, which um, basically delivers metadata in XML format. This is the aforementioned ISO 100, uh, 19139. And um, this catalog itself is then harvested by the next higher catalog. In this case, is the German National Geo Catalog, the geoportal.de. And um, but so far, it doesn't change the structure of the data. It's just um, a, well harvesting, collecting all the data of the little catalogs. And um, this is the catalog that is in the end harvested but by data.europa.eu. Um, and a bit of motivation here is that, well, there is a lot of metadata already available, but it's not in the right format for uh, in da for data.europa.eu. So um, that is also something Tore had, has shown before is the Geo harvesting component that basically takes a lot of the available data and translate it, uh, translates it into a format that is um, understood by the harvesting mechanism of uh, data.europa.eu. And um, here I have a small example of how the mapping would look like. So it's a very simple example. It's the title of the data set. So that would be the orig original metadata um, in ISO 19139. And then we map it to DCAT AP. So it gets a bit compactor. And um, something important to notice is that we basically annotate the, the text with the 
a, the appropriate language, um, which is something that we will see in the next slide, is um, important for the for data.europa.eu because um, as we see here, the data set that we basically find in data.europa.eu is translated to the language that we are looking for. So in this case, we have data in English, while the original data was in German, um, but we could also open it in Greek and then uh, the title and the description are translated to the appropriate languages. Um, okay, then um, one or one of the most important aspects of the data is um, the distributions, because we don't only want to find descriptions of the data, we want to actually download the data, we want to be able to use the data. And that is only possible if we provide links to that data. And um, for geodata, we have two primary primary ah, primary sources. So one is geoservices. In those for those is relatively simple. We take the service URL and we map that service URL as a distribution. And um, then we also have data sets. And data sets usually come with online resources that describe links to the, to the data, but not only to the data itself, not necessarily. And that is a point where we get a lot of questions and which is relatively, well, it's not that easy to see or it's not necessarily obvious how that works. And um, the thing is that these online resources, they can describe distributions or what we understand as distributions, but depending on the function code, they can also have other information. So for example, if your function code is information, you it might be a link to a website that provides further information for that uh, data set. So it's not necessarily a distribution that leads the user to a download and to a downloadable file. So um, th for that reason, based on the DCAT AP, GeoDCAT AP mapping, we only consider those online resources as distributions that have a function code that is either download, offline access, or order. So if you have metadata that has that have um, online resources, but they don't have one of those three function codes associated with it, then we will map those URLs, but they are not going to be mapped as distributions. So they are not going to be visible on the portal as such. And um, I have a small code um, example. So that is how an online resource could look like. So we have the link to the data, we have a name, and then we have this function code and the the most or the important bit for us is the function of that online resource so we can decide whether it's a distribution or not um, so if you have metadata that is harvested but by data.europa.eu and the distributions are not showing then this is the most likely reason for that Um, yes, so if you have geodata and your data is in one of those two formats, then additionally to just downloading the data, um, the distributions also allow you to open a small 
preview of that data. So there is a small web viewer that you can load your WMS or your GeoJSON in to see how it would look like before downloading the data. Um, yes, and that is more or less what I wanted to show you about the harvesting progress uh, process. Um, if you manage a geo portal or another portal that is containing public sector information and you would like to be harvested, then you can um, contact contact us under this contact form and then we can work with you. We can create a harvester in our test environment and then we can see what is necessary for your data or for your catalog to be harvested um, in data.europa.eu. And at that point, I will hand back to you, Toro, for the Q&A. Thank you, Jan. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion already uh, in the chat, which is nice to see. Um, still, we want to make this um, properly so that we um, all have uh, the same view on the things which were asked in the chat and the same answers. Um, so please, again, use Slido, use this QR code or use this one. And there's already, <laughs> excellent, there's already um, quite a bit of questions uh, present already. Um, you can upvote um, the questions using Slido with a thumbs up and we will prioritize um, the answering of the questions based on the um, thumbs up feature there. Please um, take a moment and uh, when your questions weren't already answered in the chat, which quite a bit already were, um, but if you want to discuss it further, repost it simply using Slido and then we'll um, try to answer the questions you might have. So there's already quite a bit of questions we already have. And we'll allow for the repost of some of the questions. And the most upvoted questions at the moment is in some countries, e.g. Norway, the National Open Data Portal harvests the geodata portal. How do data.geo.eu solve duplicates when harvesting both? I think this is one of the questions which has already been answered in the chat, but for completeness sake, um, I'll try to answer it again. Um, so the best thing would be if there would be consistent identifiers. Um, if there are not, um, we reach out to the portals and try to find out on how to avoid those duplicates. Um, I think this is the same answer which was posted in the chat, um, but uh, as a, how should I put that? As an appeal to you, um, you also benefit from consistent identifiers on the national level as well. So um, I would wonder myself if, um, or how you handle duplicates on your site. And if there is no mechanism, it would be nice um, if you would introduce one. But if you haven't, due to reasons, um, then we'll try to fix it in the harvesting process. I hope that this answers um, your question. Um, and I would check it then. If it doesn't completely answer your question, feel free to post a follow up question using Slido. Then the next most upvoted question is, would it be possible to ask for harvesting of EU, Pacific, EU project specific catalogs exposing multi-country datasets, EA data that comes from different countries? Uh, very good question. I think it was also answered already in the chat. Um, there is cases where this is done, especially for um, institutions which have uh, a continually mandated um, 
yeah, um, yeah, work contract or or work which they perform for mul um, multiple countries like e.g. Eurostat, which I harvested. If it's in a research context, it depends um, on the fact if it's already harvested by other portals in the um, national um, states and if it's um, envisioned that this portal will be present for uh, a long time. It doesn't make sense for us, but that is a bit of a personal view of mine um, to harvest a portal which only exists for two to three years and then it's gone. But if it's like really something valuable, then for sure, then it will be harvested. And then please um, uh, contact us so that we can take care of that. It is um, probably also decided on a case by case basis. But please feel free to contact us. The next question, and perhaps Julia can also um, jump in as well there, is what role will Data.Europa um, play in the implementation of the High Value Datasets Act, which was recently um, processed a step further, I would say, uh, in the European Commission? Um, yeah, um, I cannot really say much about it. Uh, I would uh, uh, rather um, give the floor maybe to my colleagues uh, in the publications office, uh, um, uh, Giuseppe. Um. Yes, uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, well, our role for the high value datasets is obviously uh, to make them available on data.europa.eu. So we will have uh, uh, specific sections where these high value datasets will be uh, available for further use. Um, yes, so the the final list should be coming in the coming uh, months or so before the end of the year. Uh, so yes, this will be our role. As of now, we also kind of write in data stories which uh, tackle the topic of high value data sets. So we try to provide an overview uh, to users of data and our website on what high value data sets are and what um, what they include uh, not only in topic wise but also with technical characteristics that this high value data sets needs to be uh, available to the public thank you Giuseppe I also shared the link to uh, the data story that was mentioned thank you excellent and then the next uh, Giuseppe is perhaps also for you um, do you have any license that you or the publications office prefers for metadata to harvest or to have actually CC BY or CC0, for example? Well, uh, maybe it is not actually for me. Uh, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, data sets which are CC BY 4.0. Uh, um, I believe maybe my colleague Agar might uh, know more specifically if which one we prefer, but I do know for a fact that the CC BY 4 is uh, the most the com most commonly used in our portal? Yeah, well, I, we can speak, let's say, as, um, as a European institution, we by default have a CC by four, but, but of course, if it's completely public, then CC by zero, although it really depends on the national context, because of course, uh, especially when, de when dealing with um, national portals, there is a specific legislation and and that is the one that should be followed. But yes, let's say as as open data consumers, then CC by four and CC um, zero are the way to go. Yeah. Perhaps to, to add from a geospatial point of view to that statement, um, to avoid large uh, um, um, attributions in the corner of the map, which can be quite large if we have a data and use data of geospatial data which needs to be attributed. Um, the geospatial community tries to push for CC0 or the national equivalent. So without attribution in order to make reuse of the data um, easiest because in maps it's common practice to um, display the attribution at all times. And um, if everybody wants to be attributed, uh, then it quickly gets crowded uh, in the attribution section of maps. Okay. Is the mapping made in collaboration with the portals themselves? 
um, if the question refers to the mapping from the ISO metadata to um, DCAT metadata, then no, um, that was the joint research effort way back when, uh, starting back I think in 2012 or even before that, by the JSC um, and other institutions. So it was a combined research effort which was public on how to align the metadata and the uh, states um, uh, were also involved, not equally I think because it was an open process um, and the, yeah, the mapping, um, the metadata mapping in essence um, was, uh, how should I put this, spearheaded by different institutions um, in different phases in time. And then it's followed up um, because we also have quite a bit of national dialects for decade AP. So I know for a fact there's more than a dozen in, in Europe um, to cover all the specific uh, uh, details of the member states or the partners, and um, then we need to account for them as well in the housing process. So in essence, um, there is communication to the portals for sure, but the initial alignment uh, was a research effort to be headed by multiple institutions and persons. Which translation engine is used in the background for the portal? Um, I think this was also already answered in the chat. Um, it's the machine translation service um, from the European Commission. Um, perhaps someone might elaborate, elaborate a bit more. I think I can take this one. Uh, yes, for the, um, uh, namely the titles and the um, um, description of data sets, we use the machine translation. Uh, of course, with DCAT AP and GeoDCAT, you can, um, for example, if you think of multilingual uh, countries, you can have the same data set yours that always does that, for example, in more than one language. Um, so this is supported by the data model, but then for the missing um, the official language, we use machine translation for that. And then the more static content is um, normally uh, translated by people. So yeah. we have a whole process where we basically realize if uh, we're missing title, how to send it to the translation service and get the answer back. You can find more, docu more documentation on our GitLab space, so GitLab uh, Data Europa. Thank you. And then perhaps as a follow up, the next uh, question, what open licenses are included? CC, CC by, CC share like, unlicensed, Apache, public domain. Um, also the question to the floor. Well, again, we harvest whatever you indicate is the license and this is something that needs to be decided on, on an organizational and more often national level. Uh, so whatever license you provide, we harvest it. You should follow DCAT AP in, in terms of how to indicate which is the license used. So normally it's a URL to the actual license. But okay. um, yeah. the follow up portion of that question is Planet I N I C F I data included. I'm not quite sure of what to make of, of that specific portions of the question. If uh, the person who has asked that might follow up with a rephrasing of that portion of the question, perhaps we can answer it um, at a later time. Then the next question is, do you harvest the assets items of the feeds or only the top level feeds, e.g. the metadata of GeoJSON files? Jan, this might be one for you. Um. I'm not 100% sure what this uh, question aims for. Um, so principally we would um, harvest whatever is a data set or a service. So if we have, for example, an atom feed or something like that, we would um, only harvest that the metadata of that atom feed, not the content of that feed. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, 
um, we can follow up also, we do not look actually at the metadata of the services itself. So a WMS and a WFS typically has also associated metadata in the service description and the get capabilities document, and this is also not looked at. So only the data which is exposed via the um, catalog service in itself, so the catalog service of the web, um, the CSW, that is used and looked at and um, transformed or translated. There is no kind of enrichment going on in the harvesting. If there would be, for example, for detecting the duplicates, then that would be a, a specific um, action which would be um, coordinated with the uh, corresponding portal. Then the next question is, it seems that Inspire metadata elements encoded as GMX Anchor are not translated into DKAP. Have you checked? That is that fairly is specific. <laughs> that is probably also for me. Um, yeah. I have to say, I think it's a case by case um, situation. So if you have a concrete example or a general or if it is really a general thing where you notice that um, please send us some examples like some metadata where that happens and which um, elements you would have expected to be mapped and then we can have a look at that so please contact us uh, and we can check it specifically. Um, also, um, the the logic of how it's translated is um, available in the corresponding um, uh, repository where the uh, code is, is made public. Um, yeah. But please contact us. Then the next most upvoted question would be, is data.europa.eu catalogs contents available as API CSW? I know for sure that it's available as a Sparkle endpoint. I'm not sure if it's available as a CSW. I don't think so, but Jan? No, um, it's not anymore because, well, it's not geodata anymore. It's not uh, ISO metadata as such anymore. So I think there is this SparkQL endpoint, and that is, I think, the only public endpoint. Yeah, we also have uh, an API, but uh, again, it's DCAT AP because once it's in Data Europa, you it's DCAT, it's transformed to DCAT AP, so it's the only way to get the data. Yeah, it might be worthwhile to check the um, JSC's portal, the Geo portal. They might expose um, their portal data as a CSW, but I'm I haven't checked for years and years. I'm not up to date on that one. What technologies are used in the backend? Where is it hosted? Um, I'm, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, uh, the the sources are available on the corresponding Git space. I think we could post the link perhaps here, and then you can have a look for yourself. Um, it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, hosted in uh, in a joint effort with DG Digit. But please. Um, uh, if the publications office could also elaborate a bit more on that. And for the geo harvester is a um, Apache camel um, instance that is basically using XSLT to transform the XML from one schema to the other. I think having a look at the GitLab is also um, quite informative at the GitLab space because there's everything available there. Yeah. And the next question would be, any plans in the future to merge Inspire Metadata with Decade AP, Geo Decade AP? I think that is an excellent question, um, but also one um, which is probably highly debated and regulated based upon the different directives we have to um, follow or or um, check with. Um, so Inspire and the Open Data Directive um, are go way back when. So th this has been um, 
in the works for for almost decades now, especially for Inspire and the uh, old PSI directive, which has been superseded, um, is also quite a <laughs> quite old and has been updated as we go. And uh, it's an interesting question which would merit discussion in the community, I think. Um, but we see, and that is a personal opinion, we see in the directors which are emerging at the moment, um, for example, with the high value data sets and the list of the high value data sets, that there seems um, to be a large overlap there because uh, quite a bit of the high value data sets are geodata. Um, and actually reference in the draft, which was published and, and voted upon, um, Inspire Annex themes. So um, it, it might be in the cards, but I don't know for sure. I think that is discussed elsewhere in the community itself. But perhaps we have additional insight from the publications office. I don't have more than what I've just stated. No, I think as you said, uh, I think this is discussed uh, among other communities, even within the commission, there is different departments which discuss uh, the way forward uh, with depending with this um, with these files. So we are also here to kind of see what uh, the future will bring in this case. Excellent. There's quite a lot of questions. I quite enjoy this. Um, I, I hope we'll manage to answer all of them uh, in the time we've left. Um, do you use SDM X standards? I'm not quite sure what that is. Jan, might you elaborate a bit on that if you know that? I guess that is for statistically statistical data and our part does not use it because while well, we concentrate on geodata. Um, so that's all I can say to that. Okay. And then uh, is the algorithm method you use to map ISO 19139 to decade AP public? Are you going to publish it? Thanks. It is publicly available uh, available on the GitLab space. Um, so the alignment there is public. And if you look for aligning um, ISO metadata to decade AP or look at geo decade AP itself, the specification, so just search for GeoDecade AP, um, then you'll find the GeoDecade AP standard and it is quite exhaustive. It's actively worked upon um, and it uh, basically um, is the cookbook, uh, which we uh, yeah, translated into um, software um, on how to, to map the um, ISO metadata to Decade AP. There is a few oddities in there which have been worked upon in the latest version um, and there needed to be adjustments needed to be made in DCAT AP itself on how it handles services, APIs and data sets. Um, but um, in essence, the method is uh, available on the GitLab space. Anything to add, Jan? No. Um. Uh, Multilingual elements read and taken into account for ISO decade AP. Jan, that's for you, I think. Yes, uh, um, I think there is a way um, to do it in ISO to define multilingual elements, and um, we are mapping those uh, well, pretty much the same way we would map one a single language. Um, Data set, we just have then two titles, each annotated with a different language. Yeah, I remember a discussion back in 2018, I think, with Eurostat, um, because they published also um, multilingual elements and especially um, the states, uh, the, the member states, um, which are have multilingual uh, portions of the, the public, um, and they published the metadata multilingual. We always make a case to not. Um, throw away the the officially uh, published metadata. So if there is something uh, which is published by the national portals, we always take this into account and prefer it over machine translated services. I think this was uh, implemented way back when. Harvesting means replication of files, question mark. If yes, wouldn't it be better and on the fly search view. I think this is 
more log, more of a discussion point than um, a question. At least I understand it in this way. Um, harvesting means replication of metadata, not the actual files. So the data itself is hosted on the respective systems. The um, portals which we harvest indicate. Um, so this, those are the distributions. Um, so yes, uh, the metadata is replicated, but the data not. Um, and then you follow up with if yes, so ah, uh, wouldn't it be better to uh, do an on the fly search uh, view of that. So when the CSW standard was conceived, we had something called hop counts where we could um, do a distributed search of all the different CSV catalogs. So when one portal or one catalog was federated in essence with another uh, CSV catalog, um, then you could search remotely um, on those um, yeah, um, metadata catalogs there. And I think this is what is indicated with this question here, like an on-the-fly search, go to the system itself, which is somewhere else. And um, IT mainstream um, basically uh, says no, because the metadata itself is so small, it's easier to replicate the metadata and uh, have it um, available at all times at the speed which the European um, at data.europa.eu wants um, in responses because users, when they open up the site, they expect a quick search response. And if you would hop all the way to one of the originating portals, the processing of the request might take a very long time and we couldn't really make any assumptions uh, on how long it takes. So therefore, the metadata is um, duplicated, but not the data itself. Um, then the next question would be, what is the motivation for harvesting all this metadata information? What is the added value? I can uh, relate this question back to the floor. My personal uh, opinion or my point of view and statement is, which we said from the beginning, um, we want to improve the data. We want we make it available in different languages and we want to be as the data.europa.eu portal, the single point where you can stop and search for all the different data sets and metadata in uh, Europa itself. So this is the added value because if you search in your native tongue, a data set, you will find the data set from all the other different states as well on data.europa if they are there. And you do not need to know the addresses, the URLs and the language um, of the international portals. And so this collection effort in itself is one of the added benefits and values. Exactly, Tor, that was uh, perfectly put. Uh, that is basically our, the mission of data.europa.eu is to make this data also available to find and findable for all the users of our portal, but also all people that are trying to look for geospatial data. So by addressing this metadata, we make that data set, that information also available to a wide, a lot larger pool of people. And therefore that's, uh, that is the mission of data.europa.eu and that is the goal of uh, this harvesting process. Okay, so due to the advancing of time, um, I think we need to cut the question answer section here. We have got five minutes left where we want to do the quick summary and the uh, sign off. So thank um, you for all the questions. I cannot hear any more uh, Tora. I don't know if it's only me. <laughs> okay. I can hear him. I can hear him fine. Okay. Um, yes, that's yes, good to yes. know. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, again, thank you for all the questions um, uh, to um, take care of the lot of time. I would now skip the rest of the questions, but feel free to contact um, us um, with the most urgent questions uh, using, using the known ways. Um, so the last bit of this webinar is summary and feedback. Um, and uh, to make this quick, um, Data.europa.eu includes descriptions for geospatial data, geoservices, WMS, WFS, geodata itself in, in file formats or in file forms, geojson, shape, KML, and so forth, with um, coordinates or indirect spatial information. 
data.europa.eu harvests metadata from open data catalogs and geocatalogs, and the geoharvesting process requests the metadata from the originating catalogs and respects the metadata from the originating catalogs. Um, and performs the mapping between the geo metadata standards and what is needed uh, for data.eu. Um, we've had a lot of discussion in the question and answers section uh, regarding specific details. Um, I was more or less delighted to see that. Um, thank you for the high uh, level of participation. Um, and if you have it in you, please provide uh, feedback for us and help us plan for 2023 using this QR code in the last couple of minutes we have in this webinar. And this would be it from my side. Julia, any closing words? Yeah, uh, I think uh, you already stated. Or, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, please uh, um, take a look at our feedback form. This will help also to shape um, the planning of the Data Europe Academy for next year. So it's really, uh, it's really, really helpful. Um, otherwise, on the next slide, you can see uh, uh, also how to contact us, uh, to follow us on our newsletter uh, and uh, social media. I see uh, Giuseppe also posted our functional mailboxes, so if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we will also reach out to you, uh, providing you with the, um, with the material of this uh, webinar, so the slides and the recording. Um, and yes, um, I hope you had uh, you enjoyed the webinar and we look forward to seeing you soon uh, for the next ones.